Yeah, I mean, uh, said I wouldn't do it, and then, then I did it. I mean, didn't believe I'd punch a baby in the face. It was the easiest ten bucks they ever made. Oh, uh, hello. Just make sure this thing's on. Alright. Okay. So, today, whoops, didn't want to do that. At some point, I'll learn how to, uh, I'll learn to work, learn how to work technology, but I'm just a poor Amish boy from Amish world trying to make his way in the big city, the big scary city. All right, so today's uh, writing thing, today's work stream, it's me, Don, again, and we're going to examine um, using history to help you write. I'll do a couple of these, but this one particularly is going to be on examining historical weapons and armor. Uh, to encourage creativity, enhance your story, make things easier. Um, so we're just going to... Let's just jump into it. I hope Philip Franco don't sue me. I'm a big fan. Uh, anyways, I'm a firm believer that when you're stuck, making restrictions or finding restrictions helps you, right? It helps you narrow down your options. In some cases, you know, not all cases, obviously. But... It can focus your vision a little bit better and make things a little bit easier. So this is more mostly going to be geared towards, um, instead of things like not to do, like things you can do, it's going to be geared towards like people who are writing fantasy novels or historical novels that take place you know, before the age of gunpowder. So like from classical antiquity through the Middle Ages, Renaissance, things like that. Uh, and uh, if you're running a D&D &D campaign or any sort of fantasy, like if you play like Warhammer or something like that, like a Warhammer, like a Warhammer um, tabletop gaming that isn't the actual war gaming, you know, maybe you homebrew D&D &D with Warhammer, whatever the case may be. All right, let's just go into it. The first, hold on, sorry. The first thing you should know is that the primary implement of warfare was spears. We tend to see swords a lot, and swords are really cool. They are the coolest melee weapon. Um, that's, you know, without a doubt true, at least in my opinion. But the primary implement of warfare were spears. Pull arms in general, but spears mostly. This is one of the first tools slash weapons that humanity ever created. Uh, and it's been used in warfare all the way up to... You kind of, well, a little before industrial times. You know, it was still somewhat used. In, it was still used in the age of gunpowder in some way, shape, or form. Uh, here of gunpowder weapons, but primarily the spear was were really the weapons of choice, and again led to other weapons, pole arms, things like that. Pole arms, anything pretty much on a pole or a haft, and we'll get into those later on. Uh, spears are useful in both in single combat and mass formations, and they're easier to use. And the reason I say they're easier to use is that most spears you can really only do one thing with. And that's thrust. You can cut, you can cut with them to a certain extent, but you just kind of keep poking at them, changing the levels. You know, go for the face, go for the legs, go for the body. You know, whatever. You just can keep continually do that, and it makes it better for formations as well. Um, for in, in terms of single combat, you can fight somebody else with a spear or the pole arms. Even with the sword, it actually has a very give you you have great advantage using a spear against someone with a sword. Um, if you're have even a cursory familiar or like a passing familiarity with how to use a spear versus someone who's an expert swordsman, you are going to have an advantage, and you, you, it's certainly kind of your fight to lose. Not saying you will win every single time, but it's a massive advantage. It's sort of like being like like you're fighting somebody who is like half your size. It's like, are you going to beat that person? Yes, you're going to beat the person every time. No, there's a chance they can defeat you, but chances are the fight's kind of yours to lose. Formations this is useful because weapons, uh, swords that have, um, most swords are cut and thrust weapons, so they can slash or they can stab, pretty much is what that means. And the problem with that is when you're in close formation with somebody, you, keep, you have kind of, and you have a shield, and the shields are locked in a shield wall, which most formations were. The problem is you can hit your opponent, or you can hit neither your opponent, you can hit your teammate, rather, because um, you're kind of sort of flailing around. You can't just continually stab with it. I mean, you could, but if you're just going to do that, why not have a spear that has a longer reach and is a uh, purpose built for that? 
uh, and <coughs> you also have the reduced uh, range of movement because you have some of the left to you, you have some of the right to you. You can't move back and forth. You know, there's just not much you can do. With a spear, it's absolutely no problem if you just stand there and just continue to, to stab over your shield into the opponent. Uh, they were easier to produce as well. Um, it's just basically you take a stick or a piece of wood, you shape it into a cylinder, put a counterweight on one end and a sharp end on the other. Uh, that's it, pretty much. And spears have been used by every civilization in one form or another. Uh, there are as many variations of the spear as there are ways to use it. You know, it. any way you can make a, a, a think of a spear that you could use for spear hunting, you know, sport, combat, there's a spear for that. Or at least some sort of variation of it. Incredibly versatile weapon and truly the workhorse of human warfare still to this day, because the spear has been used in warfare longer than uh, gunpowder weapons have been. So, moving on. The pole arms. Uh, now, there are two different spellings of pole arms. The first one, the P-O-L-A-R-M-S, is actually the proper uh, spelling for it. Pole arms is sort of a later um, spelling of it. Both are correct, but if you want to be, if you look going for authenticity in your story or your D&D campaign, you'd go with the first spelling rather than the second. Uh, pole arms really kind of came into itself when armor and different tactics were, were developed to defeat the spear, or at least make the spear less effective. Uh, and this always happens in warfare. You know, if somebody has a particular weapon or a tactic, people find weapons to defeat it. You know, people came out with tanks, they developed anti-tank weapons. You know, people started flying aircraft, anti-aircraft artillery, anti-aircraft missiles, so on and so forth. You know, the most common example is somebody makes firearms, somebody makes a bulletproof vest, somebody makes a round that defeats that bulletproof vest, somebody makes a, or I should say body armor. Not, there's no, bot, no bulletproof vest is actually bulletproof. So they make a round that defeat the existing body armor, body armor gets better, so on and so forth. And pulled arms are no, are no different. Um, used at a time when armor was so effective that shields were no longer necessary. So we're looking at around the time of plate armor. So we're looking at kind of uh, 13th, 14th century, somewhere around there. I think more like 14th century, 15th century, things like that. When full plate armor suits were, don't quote me too much on the dates. I may be off a little bit. Uh, but when full plate armor was becoming uh, more common. That's when pole arms were used. They were often multi-purpose. Uh, for instance, one of the most common was this, the Lucerne axe. As you see, it has a kind of a, a pickaxe type end to it, a long spear point and a hammer. So this is very effective against armor. Generally speaking, you see a lot of times, and we'll get to this more in the armor section, where armor people were armor, but people always stab through it and slash through it. You really couldn't. You had to have specialized weapons. And that's why some of these have like really weird shapes, like this. Uh, a second, this axe over here, this type of pole arm. It, it looks like somebody screwed up making a weapon, and that's what it came out to be. And you have weird things like this. They all served a particular purpose. Um, it depended on the user and what weapon you were uh, facing at the time. Uh, interesting fact about this: this is actually a war scythe. Most of the time, if you want to have a scythe in your um, campaign you want to be historically accurate instead of the traditional farming scythe where the blade is kind of curved off that way up the haft um, you can still kind of do it and it still is somewhat useful in combat but this is really the more effective use of a uh, this is really a kind of historically accurate war scythe this is more or less the true war scythe rather than the scythe that you see in you know anime and things like that not less cool but if you're going for realism, that's what you look for. Uh, and you have other things like, you know, axe heads at one end, same things, long spears to get in between the plates of armor to puncture through it. Uh, same thing on, on this end. I mean, again, there are dozens upon dozens. I mean, there's like hundreds of variations of pole arms. And also different civilizations had different, um, different pole arms. These are European pole arms. Of course, you have... You know, a good example is like a Japanese pole arm, like a naginata, which is essentially just a wakazashi, a short katana, or short sword rather, on a pole. 
these were used widely even into the age of gunpowder even when armor was kind of stripped down because gunpowder weapons were becoming more and more effective at piercing them um, and again these were used in mass formations as well um, people didn't use shield walls too much because while well, armor was a lot more effective against gunpowder weapons wooden shields were not anywhere near as effective as metal armor were a steel armor I should say uh, so that's where these mostly come into play, and you see these still all the way up into the Renaissance. You see them from kind of the middle to late Middle Ages to the Renaissance. So if your story or D&D &D campaign is set there, there you go. Plus in a lot of D&D &D games, they have different pole arms and things like that. So you kind of know how they're used a bit. Alright. Next, the sword, your ubiquitous sword. And I, I, I really like this picture because it kind of shows you the uh, evolution of the sword. You, know, you have the Mesopotamian, so you have the Middle Eastern and uh, Northern African swords, you know, from Egypt to the Greek swords, uh, kind of Italian. You kind of see the Japanese tachi up here, Japanese tachi. Those, those are kind of cut off, but they're katanas. I assume you know what they what they are. Some more obscure weapons and Indian weapons. German messer. Messer just means knife. Uh, you have the Chinese swords and things like that. So I really like this picture. Uh, it shows a wide variety of swords and kind of the a, an excellent evolution of them. Pretty accurate. Obviously, there's more there, but this is a a pretty good uh, a pretty good uh, representation of them. Uh, and as stated before, these were not the primary implements of war. These were sidearms. A uh, good example to uh, a good comparison is imagine the spear as a modern day soldier's rifle. And a sword as their pistol. Um, you'd carry it as a backup weapon in war, but primarily a pull weapon of some sort uh, was your primary. And also, if you were going around town and you wanted to have a weapon to defend yourself, even if you were nobility later on, people had you know kind of commoners had access to swords um, because they were expensive and they became easier and easier to make. And you know certain laws, depending on the country, Japan, for instance, had laws for a while a period of their history that prohibited anybody from samurai from wearing swords, spe specifically katanas. Um, but if you were like a nobleman going out on the town, or if you were in like Renaissance Italy, you would carry a sword on your side that was allowed depending on the rules and the time. So it was, it was kind of like, again, similar to how in modern day, at least America, people can seal carry pistols. Uh, that was their personal defense weapon. Uh, and that's the role that swords used. There were also status symbols. Um, people created ornate swords. A lot of times you didn't want to do too much to the blade. Um, and as you can see, these blade shapes are more or less pretty tame. You know, they're nothing too fancy. Probably the fanciest is uh, Indian Kora over here. And I believe this is the uh, Dacian Falks, which is kind of a weird hybrid between like a coppice and a kukri on a stick almost a little you know you have the cleavers here which is also kind of weird uh but for the most part and again you have the flam bears which is the uh uh the flammenschwert which just means flame sword in german but the flam bears you have this kind of wavy blade but for the most part they were pretty simple you know straight lines for the most part you have leaf blades your earlier swords um, they didn't have like serrations with these big spikes on them. Don't, I mean, these, by the way, are not spikes. These are lugs and these are primarily, we don't know for certain what they are, but they're more or less protection for what's called half sorting. So you grab your dominant hand right here and your support hand would grab right here. This is usually the Ocaso, is what this part of the sword is called. And it's usually blunt, so you can hold on to it. And you would use like a spear and allow you better manipulation again between plates of armor because again you can't stab through armor uh you could with a pole arm with weapons such as this you could stab through armor but with a sword you're not stabbing through armor you have to get in between the plates at least plate armor you could stab through and split the rings of mail but we'll get to that when we get the mail So if you have any weapons with serrations on there, don't. I mean, they may look cool, but they're really not effective in combat. And again, you see, you see throughout this, 
evolution of swords from different lands. You know, this is like from the Earth, this is from like the Bronze Age, all the way up to the Renaissance era. That's pretty much the uh, the spread there. But you notice there are not a lot of um, not, not a lot of serrations. You have these weird points here, but again, for the most part, no serrations, no big long spikes coming out of there. Um, that just it's not an effective sword. Uh, I mean, if you're going for cool factor, do it. But if you're going for historical accuracy, uh, don't do it. And also, don't mess around with the blades too much in terms of inscribing and etching and things like that. If you want a good alternative to it, now there were swords that did that, but they weren't really used in combat or made for combat. And if they were, the examples are rare. If you want a good compromise between there, you can make the scabbard of the sheath of the sword ornately decorated. That was done. Um, that way the geometry of the blade and its structure wasn't messed with too much. Uh, and these were more ex expensive than pull weapons in general. And also it should be noted that a blacksmith could make a spear, could make an axe, could make a dagger or a knife or whatever, could make arrowheads, things like that. But you needed to be a swordsmith to make swords. Now a swordsmith is a type of blacksmith, but it's a special it's a special skill set. It's really the difference between a regular mechanic and a mechanic that works on sports cars or supercars, you know, like the Ferraris and Lamborghinis and things like that. Um, I guess a better example would be maybe for sports fans, at least American sports fans, imagine like blacksmith that can make swords, axes, spears as like Division Two athletes versus a swordsmith who's Division One athlete. Not saying that the other smiths weren't skilled, but sword making, swordsmithing was a skill set all on its own. Uh, and again, a lot of times the price per, per, uh, the price prohibited commoners from using them, not necessarily laws. Although there were examples where laws were passed where commoners couldn't use them. But for the most part, it was you just didn't have the money. And most of the cost came from the materials, not the labor. Because medieval societies worked on a vassal serf thing. Uh, uh, vassal and serp system. So a lot of times it was just the materials that were the bulk of the cost and labor was relatively cheap. Um, they're also seen as magical uh, in both in real life and fantasy stories uh, for good reason. I mean, like they're fucking cool. There's really no other way to say that. Also, the only example... You see the, the Roman Gladius over here? This is one of the only examples, one of the main examples, of an army using a sword as their primary weapon. Uh, it's the exception to the rule that spears and pole weapons were used as uh, implements of war. Early Roman infantry did use uh, spears and shields, similar to the Greek hoplite, or a hoplite, which is kind of what you see in... Uh, you know, the Greek hoplite is what you see as Spartans and Athenians and things like that in ancient Greek combat. They did use spears and shields, but eventually they evolved to have these large tower shields called scutums. We'll get into shields later on in the video. And uh, they would use the short sword for the same reason. Now, you could cut with the gladius, but it was primarily a thrusting weapon. And, uh, I mean, I don't have to tell you how effective the Roman Empire was with this tactic. They used it for centuries, and their empire and their eff uh, the effects of that empire are still being felt to this day. Moving on. Axe, and by the way, I'm not trying to turn this into a huge history lesson. These are all just kind of brief overviews to help you with the story. Because obviously I don't know your particular uh, the particular um, well, the particulars of your story. So these are just kind of things to help you out a little bit. Uh, axes, again, also use the secondary weapons. The Exception to this rule are Viking, uh, particularly House Carls, which would have these large two-handed Dane axes, kind of what we think of as the, uh, um, you know, the Viking axe, essentially. There were uh, shorter handheld ones, and the axe heads were not massive. They were very small, relatively small, and the blades were thin. They weren't thick. Um, they were thicker near the spine, obviously, around here, around the actual haft of the uh, axe, rather. And they... Th tapered out very thinly to here. And these were effective because even if you, these are mostly used during the era of uh, mail armor or chain mail armor um, if you want to call it that. And it could 
even if the plates, even if the ring stopped it, which um, they almost certainly would, the force would break whatever bones or could break, uh, had a high chance of breaking whatever bones were underneath there. So you hit down, they hit you on your clavicle. Sure, it doesn't cut into your clavicle, but it breaks your bones. Uh, same thing with your arms, your legs, things like that. Uh, they were devastating weapons, but they were primarily used as tools. Two-handed Dane axes also were sometimes classified as pole arms. Um, smaller version of them could be thrown. As a matter of fact, the Franks had a weapon called the Francisca, which before engaging the enemy in the melee, they would throw off, they would throw at the enemies in like these huge volleys. They're actually so good they can throw it in a way that it would hit the ground, bounce off the ground, and go up underneath the shields of their opponents. Um, there's some uh, there's some uh, debate within the historical community that France was actually named after the Francisca throwing axe, which makes the French sound a lot cooler, uh, which they could use the points. I'm kidding. A little bit. But again, mostly useless tools, not too much implements of war. Uh, if they did, if they were used as war, they were either they were mostly used by people who were not as rich. They weren't knights or house carls, just sort of like the Viking equivalent of a knight, kind of. The house carls were bodyguards for lords, which knights somewhat were to a certain extent. Um, that's pretty much it. They didn't see widespread use in warfare alone. They were, as shown above parts of like halberds and uh, pole axes and other pole arms like that that you often use in conjunction with other weapons uh, combined. Again, kind of like a pole axe where it's an axe head, a hammer on the other end, and a spear at the top. Maces, flails, and war hammers. These, again, were poor man's weapons. Um, these are just a couple of examples of maces from around the, at least, again, the European uh, countries. Um, they excelled against armored opponents, and they were somewhat unwieldy in dynamic combat. When I mean dynamic combat, I mean like, you know, you essentially fast-paced, you know, pitch battles against people, not one to, not uh, a single, you know, not, not like a one-on-one -on -one or a three-on-three -three or whatever, like huge armies clashing with each other. Uh, somebody, when I was uh, doing research on this, I learned about this stuff as one of my primary interests, and somebody and the video I was watching uh, from who was an expert in medieval combat said something that was uh, really kind of summed up Warhammers, Maces, and Flails is that the weapon swings you as much as you swing the weapon. And that's kind of the, pr the main issue with them, why they weren't used too much. Sure, swords weren't that effective against armor, but they were very light. Um, I should also mention that before I go. Swords, like medieval swords and things like that, even great swords, Medieval swords are about three and a half to four and a half pounds in weight. They were not these massive, unwieldy things that people think. Katanas actually weighed more than um, than European long swords. Uh, same thing with great swords. We always seem like, oh, you know, this is the 30-pound great sword. You could not swing a 30-pound great sword. Maybe if you were like a fantasy giant or had like super strength or something like that, you could, but you could not swing them. Typically, uh, battlefield great swords were about seven, you know, probably around like six to six to eight pounds. Um, sometimes nine pounds, sometimes ten. Uh, one of the reasons we tend to think that they're heavier is a lot of times we've recovered ceremonial versions of these weapons, which were made heavier than they actually were, because it's ceremonial, so you don't need to use them for combat. But like nine pounds is really on the heavy end for two-handed swords. Uh, but maces, flails, and things like that, very good against armor. And again, another reason not to use them. Knights wanted swords. They were set. They were status symbols. Um, kind of these were considered as like peasants' weapons. Uh, but they were effective and again used as secondary weapons. You wouldn't want to face somebody against a spear with a mace or a flail or warhammer. Actually, uh, interesting fact: warhammers were often used on horseback. Which is sort of strange because they are very short range weapons. They're not particularly long. And they're not huge either. But they were used mostly on horseback. Uh, I think almost certainly against other knights. Uh, they were used on horseback either to take on infantry or other armored knights on horseback. I'm not entirely sure which. Um, 
but I do know for a fact they were using the horseback. An interesting point about um, all these weapons, particularly, um, I also couldn't find much on flails. Flails do not appear much in medieval warfare, at least historical medieval warfare. I mean, there are some accounts, but they're really, they're really not a weapon that's focused on very heavily. So you really, I can't really tell you much about flails. I'm sure if you were really dedicated, you could find more examples of it. But to be honest with you, I kind of think they're stupid weapons. Uh, they're aesthetically awful. Um, same thing with sort of like some of these mace, maces, like the Poland and Hungary maces and things like that. I just don't like maces in general. Warhammers are pretty cool, but um, that's just a personal preference of mine. Uh, but one interesting thing I want to point out is that Warhammers tend to have... Uh, and maces is, is to, a, to a lesser extent, but Warhammers tend to have these comically large heads. I mean, if you see these heads, I mean, they're really no bigger than what you'd see like a modern-day claw hammer. Um, they, they, you know, and they were also one-handed weapons, generally speaking. If they were two-handed, like the Lucerne hammer, they were pole axes, or they were attached to the other end of a... Um, a poleaxe, rather, and then a Lucerne hammer is just a big war hammer, essentially, with a spike on top of it. Um, but even then, even the two-handed versions of them, the heads were really small. Uh, they they would just be way too unwieldy if you see like most fantasy war hammers. Even if you had super strength, just the physics of it, you it, they would be completely unwieldy. One of the worst examples of this. This is a spoiler for Game of Thrones, by the way, but the season's been out for over a year, so. Generally speaking, I go with the spoiler rule that if it's been out for over a year, it's free game to talk about. But Gendry's Warhammer in Game of Thrones is, without a doubt, one of the dumbest examples of a fantasy weapon ever. At least in the show. Um, I mean, Robert's Hammer, the way they depict it in a lot of the art as well, isn't anywhere near uh, effective to be used in combat, especially with so short a haft and just that big of a head to begin with. Uh, but Gendry's is particularly bad because, for one thing, if you notice on the hammers, they're flat ends. And if we go back up to pole arms, you can kind of see there's two prongs here. And prongs are good because points on the on the pole axis, like you'd see often uh, from here, here, the spikes I was talking about, they're all very thin. They're meant to go through armor or impact um, armor to the point where you bend it and crush it. They're meant to defeat armor. Gendry's Warhammer is rounded at the very end. Um, it's really stupid. That just means that all the attacks are going to glance off more than, more than likely. It's really poorly balanced. It's just a dumb-looking weapon. It's just it's awful. Don't ever make a Warhammer like that. If you're going to make a Warhammer, make it a little bit like like this shape. You know, if you're going to extend it or make it bigger, make it like that, maybe with some prongs at the end of it. It almost kind of looks like something like a, uh, a meat tenderizer, which you do see uh, historically, that Warhammers had that sort of uh, uh, face to it, the striking face. Uh, so, yeah, don't make them huge. You know, don't make them like, like Dark Souls and Elder Scrolls size and things like that, if you want it to be accurate. Now, bows. Uh, I really like this picture, again, because it, it marks it off. Like, this is a medieval longbow, and you reinforce Native American. Um, uh, devil curve bow, Western Asian angular bow, things like that. Um, different types of bows. There are, you know, other types of bows. Again, these are Europeans, so there's not... Or in American in terms of Native American. Uh, I should say these are Western bows, for the most part. Um... Not too much in Asian. I mean, I guess you, if you consider Crimea, uh, uh, Crimean Tartars, you know, depending on whether you consider it Eastern European or Asian. Regardless, there aren't you don't have like the Yumi or the Daikyu, or uh, which are Japanese bows or other uh, bows from Korea and China, and China and things like that. But for the most part, bows or bows are the kind of also the same purpose. It's a bent stick with a string on it that fires straight sticks with a sharp end and feathers on the other end. Uh, simple but effective. Uh, here in lies the one of the biggest misconceptions. Bows are often given to weaker characters in movies and fantasy and television and things like that. That's not really true. One, 
you can't just pick up a bow and use it effectively particularly older bows that required years and years of training. You know, modern bows have sights, and if it's a compound bow, it has pulleys and things like that to kind of help out. Uh, you're looking at the term of like a high-end uh, high end compound bow, modern one, is around between like a 60 and a 90 pound draw. An average war bow, um, or bow meant for war, because hunting bows had lower, had lower poundage, uh, the lower pound draws. A common war bow would be around 90 at the very low end. I've heard of some as high as 150 to 180. Usually 150 is the number um, that you're looking at. So right around like 110, 120, 130 is more or less the war bow range. Um, it requires substantial strength to wield. Another thing is, and don't get pissed off when I say this, I'm just stating a fact. Men have more upper body strength and greater muscle mass. So a lot of times you see female characters in fantasy novels and things have bows. Again, it'd be, they can use them. It doesn't say you can't use them. But the reality is it, it's more a weapon used that would be more effective in the hands of males just because they're genetically predisposed to pull them back better. Because, again, it requires a lot of upper body strength. And I also say that as somebody who is an archer myself, I use a recurve bow. I don't use a compound bow. Uh, they do require uh, substantial upper body strength, both back, uh, chest, shoulders, bicep, triceps, all throughout forearms, all throughout the arms and upper body. Uh, they really require, you know, a lot of... It's a lot of strain, particularly if you're in combat and you're firing dozens, maybe hundreds of arrows. And again, the bows we have now are nowhere near the draw weights of... Uh, older bows, like medieval bows, and things like that. And there are reproductions that um, do meet that poundage, but they're few and far between. Not only really hardcore archers use them, and historical or history buffs use them. Um, and again, archers, at least European archers, particularly English, English archers, trained from, their, from the time they were about 7 to about 18. And that was sort of when they were kind of put into service around there. Um, so they had, dec had like a decade of training, decade and a half of training underneath their belt before they went to war. Um, so it's not a weapon that anybody can just pick up and use. Um, you could hunt with them, a lot of people hunted with them, but again, hunting bows were lower poundage. They still required training, but not as much as a war bow would. Uh, crossbows. Where do crossbows come into effect? Crossbows require less skill than a bow to use. Um, if you look at this, uh, particular, it has a slow rate of fire, obviously, as well. These actually have much higher rates of, uh, pull. So, like, a crossbow might have 420 pounds draw weight. But it's often not as powerful or just as powerful as a longbow that has 100 pounds. Why is this? Well, the, the, uh, prods, which is what these are called, uh, not the limbs, uh, these were much shorter than a longbow and as you can see it's not pulled back terribly far when you pull back a longbow you're pulling the back all essentially from as far as your uh not your shooting hand but your supporting hand actually holding the bow is all the way towards where you're usually at the side of your mouth or the center of your chin is where you pull the string so you have that long pull and the long limbs so the longer the pull the more energy an arrow uh, generates, you know, ob uh, the law of motion, um, an uh, object's in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So if you imagine a sports analogy, again, for Americans, for baseball players, and for Europeans, uh, footballers or soccer players, you know, when an American baseball player wants to hit a home run or he's at bat, he doesn't hold the bat kind of at, you know, up to his head. You know, kind of straight up. He doesn't just hold it and kind of have it loosely or like right by his arms, right by his shoulder. He pulls that bat all the way back, almost to where, you know, the bat is almost parallel with his back. You know, pulls it all the way behind his head and he has, you know, steps into it and there's a lot of rotation, gets a lot of power off. There's same thing with pitchers. When pitchers throw the ball, they don't just bring it up to their ear and then throw it. They lean all the way back and they twist their whole body and they throw into it because... The more that object you're propelling is being propelled, the longer it's being propelled, the more energy it's bringing up. This also applies to firearms. 
you know, the longer your barrel, the more energy it's going to the bullet is going to have coming out of the round, uh, coming out of the gun. So if you have a barrel that's ten and a half inches versus a barrel that's sixteen inches and it's the same caliber, let's say a five five six or two two three, whatever you know you want to say, they're not quite the same round, but if you uh, fire two two three out of a ten and a half inch barrel and then that that same round same kind of round rather out of a 16 inch barrel the 16 inch barrel is going to have more energy because that bullet's been traveling down the barrel for longer so crossbows generally had more uh, uh, greater draw weights but comparable power now uh, that's one of the reasons for this right here the stirrup as you would put the, your foot in the ground and you would anchor it so you pull down you keep it anchored there and use all your weight to pull the string back to the this uh knock right here it's not right here rather sorry and uh, also crossbow bullets are much shorter but they require nowhere near the amount of time and training and skill that it is to use a, a longbow they were incredibly effective every bit as effective as a longbow but they were much easier. You can give this to somebody, you know, again, it took years, about a decade to properly train an archer. And I'm just kind of throwing that number out there as kind of a general number versus, you know, I could teach somebody to use a crossbow in a day. Uh, but they did have a much slower rate of fire. In general, about for every one crossbow bolt from the tests I've seen, for every one crossbow bolt, that a crossbowman can get off, a bowman can get off around two to four arrows. Uh, it also depends on the uh, method of using a crossbow, because this is just the this is the simplest version of it. There are some that have cranks on the end of it, so you have like these two levers and you crank it up to get the uh, uh, bowstring pulled back. There's also some that have like this sort of claw um, contraption. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. But basically, you would grab onto it. Sometimes it's attached to your belt, and you would grab onto it, and you would stand up as you put your foot in the stirrup and pull it back because you needed the extra uh, leverage to pull the uh, string back. Um, but these are very common, and often crossbows came up against English longbowmen uh, historically, and the crossbowmen kind of suffered, both as a result of the advantages of the longbow and the training and experience of the English longbowmen. A fun fact, the Welsh made the best archers in Britain, uh, on average. All right. Now we move on to armor. Those are sort of the, the basic melee weapons. I mean, there, could, there are other melee weapons, but they weren't as important. Like, I didn't add daggers in there. Daggers and knives, pretty self-explanatory how they're used. You can throw them. They're used in close combat. Similar to other weapons, if it's not armored, you kind of stab and slash and uh, wherever you can, you know, vulnerable points. If there is armor, you get in between the uh, plates of the armor, which we will discuss here. I really like this picture because it kind of shows, again, a, a brief kind of overview of armor throughout the period. And this is post-Roman, so uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire. And you can see it's just kind of basic uh, armor. If you ever see a Lorica segmentata, I, I should have put a picture up here of it. Um, look up a Lorica segmentata, L-O-R-I-C-A-S-E-G-M-E-N-T-A-T-A, -A -A, which is kind of a Roman armor that has like overla overlapping um, thin uh, steel plates. They abandoned that. It went to uh, mail, uh, which you kind of see here. This is more like what a late Roman uh, soldier would also wear as well. You know, these are all post-Roman. Uh, Norman right here, which were, for those of you who don't know, Norman come from Normandy, which were uh, the Normandy region of France, who were originally Vikings that the um, French nobility gave Normandy to. It's pretty much to say, you know, we don't want to have to deal with you and fight with you with all their constant raids. So here's land. Just settle there. Take it. And it stopped them from raiding their lands. It also stopped future Viking raids because the Normans, because it was their land, would now defend uh, Normandy from Vikings, and that way the Vikings, there's a buffer between the actual French and the um, Norse or Norman settlers there, um, between the French nobility and the Vikings. That's what, that's the role the Normans 
were, you know, kind of the idea that they would fulfill. But after certain generations, they integrated into French society. Then they invaded England rather successfully. Uh, it's because of their invasion we call cow beef and chicken poultry and things like that. It comes from French words. Uh, but I digress. But you kind of see, you know, uh, chain mail. Again, this really should just be called mail. It's not really called chain mail. Um, transitional uh, mail and plate. You have Gothic types of armor, Maximilian type of armor, and you have the more complete armor as it goes on. And then it kind of gets stripped down when, uh, you know, it says 1675. So you're looking, this is more like uh, English Civil War armor. Um, I mean, it was used throughout other European uh, histories, but the kind of the European Civil War, the War of the Roses, is really where the major conflict you'd see that armor. Okay. And also, I should say, it, armor involved, uh, evolved in response to weapons and vice versa, as I stated beforehand, with uh, you know, bulletproof, uh, the uh, body armor, then a bullet that defeats the body armor, then body armor that defeats the bullet that defeats the body armor, so on and so forth. All right, some of the earliest types of armor we see is called lamellar armor. It's made by layering together various materials like linen, leather, iron, and bronze. Um, this is a, a linothorax or linothorax, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Sort of, uh, it's a it's a Greek armor, and lino means linen and thorax means breastplate. So it's actually the original armors, kind of like modern Kevlar armor, where it was multiple sheets of kind of a fabric, almost uh, linen in the in the linothorax and lamellar armor case, were a single uh, a single uh, Layer wouldn't stop anything really, but multiple layers put together would. It kind of imagine like a phone book. If you were to take a page from a phone book and stab a knife through it, a single page, it's not that hard. You take five, yeah, I can stab through it. But the more and more pages you put on there, 10, 50, you know, trying to, you know, try to stab through an entire phone book, it's it, it's impossible. You just can't do it. Uh, just because there's so many layers and it's so thick, and each layer is slowing down the weapon more and more and more. That's the uh, that's the idea behind lamellar armor. Now later on, it moved from linen, and then you'd add leather, you know, kind of iron plates riveted together uh, with leather, uh, or bronze uh, plates uh, um, riveted together with leather. So you usually have leather, or you'd have like a layer of linen, layer of iron, you know, a couple of layers of linen rather than iron, a couple of layers of linen, more iron, a couple of layers of linen, more iron or bronze, and you usually have leather to attach them. Leather armor didn't really exist, I should probably say that, in um, history. Like, we kind of have this idea of, like, studded leather armor, which didn't exist. Um, you know, full leather armor we see in fantasy. That didn't exist. Uh, leather was often used in conjunction uh, in conjunction with other... Um, uh, or, like, almost like a, uh, a bonding material. So you take, like, plates of metal and you rivet that to... Um, like a leather, like a thin leather, um, a thin layer of leather, rather, and that would hold together all the metal plates. Um, the only real time that leather was used primarily as armor, if we go back to the, um, it's called a buff coat. I don't know if you can kind of see, but here's the metal breastplate, or cuirass. Um, C-U-I-R-A-S-S. Uh, that's really when leather was used. Otherwise, it wasn't used standalone armor very much at all. It was used in, in, in uh, samurai armor, kind of lacquered plates, but again, that was used in conjunction with metal. Those were uh, Japanese armor was lamellar armor. Uh, it was used by early armies in the classical antiquity period and evolved into solid bronze or iron breastplates. Now, in the Greek militaries where you'd see the line of thorax, the kind of the most common lamellar armor, um, particularly Spartans would sometimes substitute the uh, Land of thorax for breastplates, you know, stylized breastplates with muscles and musculature on it of solid bronze or solid iron. And uh, that's usually more often the armor that they would use. And this eventually gave way to male armor. So this is a really early type of armor used in classical antiquity. So think of before the Roman Empire was the Roman Empire. You think of, you're looking at classical Greek. A gambeson armor. Um, this was used, again, this is just padded armor. This is similar to lamellar armor, which is just 
thick layers of padded cloth, and it, they're really effective. They can stop. They've been shown tests have been shown uh, recreations to stop arrows from war bows, which are designed to puncture metal armor. Um, it wasn't the most effective armor, obviously. If you have mail or you have plate, you would wear that instead. But this was still used in conjunction with those armors, because a lot of times, particularly in fantasy, you know, the fa the famous chainmail bikini, you do not want to wear mail on bare skin. You just don't want to do it. It's awful. You're going to hate yourself. But gambesons were worn underneath mail. So you wear the padded jacket and then you put the mail on top of it. It provided an extra level armor and protection against blunt attacks. Um, and certain uh, t uh, certain parts in European history it was kind of a fashion. You know, it's kind of like uh, high-born people would and nob nobility would wear a gambeson as like you'd wear like a sweatshirt or a, or a long sleeve shirt or something like that. Because bo it served both as a fashion item and it was still armor. Obviously there are thicker and thinner variations of gambesons, but uh, the thicker ones are being used as armor. But it was very versatile and it was used even when plate was there because it was worn underneath plates. Again, to absorb impacts and add extra armor. Mail. Simply called mail, not chain mail. It's never ever historically called chain mail. This is usually we get this a lot of misconceptions about medieval armor and weapons from like fantasy and D and D particularly. Um, so this is just mail. Uh, it's a primary armor used by the Vikings. Vikings did not go into battle unarmored, despite what you might hear from like jackasses like Matt Pat. Um, they just didn't go into battle wearing nothing. Some berserkers were would do that. Um, Celts and um, Zulu warriors are going to uh, battle without armor, but we'll get to them later. They didn't go completely unprotected. Um, it was superseded by plate armor and kind of transitional armor like brigandines and plate and mail, which I'm going to get to later on. Again, this is worn over clothing or padded armor such as a gambeson. We don't know for certain whether or not the Vikings had gambesons. We know they had, you know, obviously shirts and things like that in their art, but we don't see anything about gambesons. And the problem with gambesons is that we, we can recover mail because metal degrades at a much, much slower rate than linen and cotton would. So the linen and cotton, by the time we discover the Viking graves and uh, uh, historical sites and things like that, the cotton and the, and the linen or whatever material the maybe uh, maybe existed um, gambeson or if gambeson existed rather it would have long decayed by the time anybody found it so we don't know if the Vikings used gambeson but we do know that later peoples used gambeson and they used it underneath mail uh, it's effective against slashing attacks a lot of times you'll see things where people will slash right through uh, mail you cannot slash through mail you can break the we can break the links of the mail, because again, for those of you who don't know, mail is just these small rings of metal that are linked together and riveted and, you know, kind of overlapping over and over and over again. Um, you could break that rivet, break it at the rivet point, or if the metal is particularly weak, and you just break it in general. You know, spears can go through it, um, not easily, but they can pierce through it, arrows can pierce through it. All another reason why you wear a gambit underneath. Because if it make it through the mail, it still has to make it through the thick gambeson. Um, but you just forget about trying to slash through this. Like maybe if you had like a Valerian steel sword or some sort of magical sword, you could do it. But in general, you were not slashing. In, in real life, you were not slashing through mail. It just wasn't happening. And mail is actually still used today. It's used by um, people that dive with sharks to prevent the shark's teeth from uh, penetrating into the flesh. But the same problem exists in that a shark can still break your arm or dislocate it just because of the sheer force and the, the bite force and them twisting it, which is, again, one of the downsides to having mail. And, again, mail is not worn by itself. It's worn over a wetsuit. Um, again, not just because, obviously, wetsuits, that's what they're designed to. They're designed for diving. But, again, you do not want to wear this on bare skin. It's a very, very, very bad idea. And this was used for a very long time before plate. Uh, this is sort of the primary armor used. Come on, girl. 
So I had to let my dogs in. And my old girl, Beagle, she's old. She doesn't hear too well, so you have to clap. <laughs> but this was used as much um, and more than plate armor was. No. Yeah. Moving on, transitional armor. So this is armor we're getting from the mail to moving on to plate. On the left, you have a brigandine. This is, again, one of the times where leather was used. Those little metal uh, circles you see in, in the uh, armor, what a brigandine is, is it's, la it's a layer of linen or leather with metal plates riveted to it. So like these thin metal plates, sort of like how you'd see on the... Uh, the plate and mail. Couldn't really find a good picture of brigandine opened up on the inside. A lot of these were surprisingly hard to find, some of the pictures. I, I didn't expect the amount of trouble I'd have. But they're like these thin strips of metal. So you'd have a strip of metal here, 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 and they kind of overlap, almost like fish scales almost. But they're long strips of metal, so like a foot long. Like they go from like these strips of metal will go from like this end to this end. And it was pretty good. Again, you would wear mail over this if you wanted even more protection. So you wear some sort of padding underneath it. I uh, use like a thin shirt with this on there. And there were some that I believe had um, all the way up to the elbow that covered the bicep and the tricep and the up on the upper arm. But again, if you want even more protection, you would wear mail over that. Uh, and then the plate mail, this is where we start to kind of get closer and closer towards plate armor. So you have mail and you have a, uh, pieces of plate attached to it. This is a Middle Eastern armor, I believe. Burgundy was mostly um, Eastern European to very popular in Hungary at one point on the 13th century, but this is mostly European armor. Plate. Incredibly effective. This was the best thing you could get. This is the best armor that money could buy at the time. You were essentially a walking tank. Um, you were pretty much invincible. Uh, you know, you have like these little part. their only weak parts were like the joints and things like that underneath the, uh, armpits. That's why these little things are here. You often sometimes see small shields and that's to protect them from getting underneath the elbow because you have arteries. I think it's the axillary artery in your arm. You also have the joints like the elbows and things like that. You see the red cloth sticking through. Uh, you would often see, again, you'd wear gambus underneath it, so you'd have the gambus to protect it, and often you'd see these thin pieces of mail that would just extend from like right here to right here, or right here to right here. They wouldn't go throughout the entirety of the arm, um, and that would protect the joints here. Uh, and again, you're pretty much completely enclosed. Uh, Really, almost no way. Uh, these thin isolates, again, were to protect the eyes because it's another weak point where somebody can uh, st uh, stab through. So they were made very, very thin to protect the eyes. Uh, yeah, you were almost invincible in this. It was really, really difficult to take out somebody in plate armor. Uh, and the best the best chance you could stand against somebody wearing plate armor is if you yourself had full plate armor. I was lightweight, around 50 to 60 pounds. And keep in mind, 50 to 60 pounds seems like a lot to wear on your body, but it's not like it's all on your back. This is distributed throughout the body, and it provided excellent range of movement. There's a video online. I didn't want to link to it because I didn't want the, this taken down or like a, get a copyright strike, or copyrighted, rather, sorry. Um, but there's a picture of a bunch of guys in... Uh, accurate reproduction plate armor and they're doing backflips and somersaults and things like that and they're running around it did restrict your movement somewhat but very little and if you think about it it wouldn't make sense to for have it to be so rigid that you couldn't move in it because you wouldn't use it at that point i mean all armor is a compromise between mobility and protection and plate armor provided at this time the best mix between the two and this was incredibly expensive, by the way. A lot of times, a quick note about gear, uh, war gear. You know, when knights got a war horse, a sword, a spear, and full plate armor, that was kind of like buying a house in the Beverly Hills all at once. It was incredibly expensive. I mean, the horse itself would cost you as much as like a modern, like a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, or like a a uh, Ford GT, like a Shelby GT or something like that would cost you today. It was immensely expensive, and the maintenance required 
for upkeep and just to keep it in working order was phenomenal. But uh, the knights were incredibly rich to begin with, so they could afford it. All right, and then you see this is the uh, buff coat I was telling you about earlier. This is the kind of armor you'd see in the English Civil War, so about the 1600s, the mid to late 1600s. On the right, this pikeman, this is a Landsknecht, or Landsknecht, depending on how you want to pronounce it. This is what you would kind of wear in the Renaissance. So you have a breastplate, and you'd have something to cover your thighs and your legs. Um, and not r really too much on the arms and stuff. So really stripped down arm, because again, these were in the era of gunpowder weapons, and, and cannons particularly. Um, you kind of get cannons, you know, at the same time you get plate armor, but at a certain point, mobility is more important than protection, because I don't care how good your armor is, you're probably not going to stop a cannonball. And even if it does stop the cannonball from penetrating you, the blunt force of it is going to do severe damage. It'll probably kill you out, right? Sorry, taking a drink of water. Um, and this is, by the way, the buff coat over here, this yellow, this is leather. And this could be worn with or without a breastplate and without a um, uh, you know, any other type of metal armor to it. Uh, particularly weapons of this day were not effective. Gunpowder weapons in the in the uh, English Civil War were often used at point-blank range or very close, between five feet to point-blank range because often it wouldn't do much. And this also provided pretty good protection against swords of the day. Uh, you wouldn't want to stand up to too many uh, hits to it. Again, the leather is nowhere near as effective as the steel plate. Uh, so there's that. And again, right here, era of gunpowder, renaissance, so you'd have um, gunner, hand gunners, is what they were called. There's somebody with a gun with a hand, you know, a gun you can use in the hand, hence the term hand gunners. Because uh, mostly the first firearm, the first mass used firearm weapons were cannons. Uh, but that's this is sort of what you see, like late era armor. Um, this is bef when we when people started just to not wear armor in general because firearms are becoming more and more advanced and they they were going through armor and it just wasn't as effective anymore. It was more important to get the hell out of the way and be mobile on the battlefield and not die of heat stroke or just be exhausted than it was to have full plate protection because the plate you'd need to stop a bullet was so thick. Particularly in the English Civil War, there was a type of cavalry called the cuirassier which had these huge, really heavy um, plates of armor. Kind of what you, people think regular plate armor is today. And you couldn't use it on... It was so heavy you couldn't use it on foot. You'd have to use it on a horse. And that could stop uh, bullets. But again, it was, so, it was so heavy that it was unusable and pretty much completely ineffective if you were on foot. Shields. Shields are perhaps, if you have to have one piece of armor for your fantasy army, it has to be a shield. They're the most widespread piece of armor and arguably the most important. Remember when I, I mentioned the Zulus and the Celts? The Zulus went to armor, or went to battle rather, wearing no armor, and the Celts went to battle as well, completely naked. One thing they both had is they had large shields. So they weren't completely unprotected, and that was, that was good enough. Shields' primary purpose is to stop missile attacks. So that's slings, bows and arrows, crossbow bolts, thrown javelins, and things like that, like the uh, the pila uh, that the Romans used, uh, or the javelins that the Greeks would use. Um, slingers, slings are just slingshots, essentially. They're a less advanced version of slingshots. And they were actually very effective, used a lot more in antiquity. Not so much uh, past that, though. Uh, but shields were incredibly important, and if you had to have one piece of armor, it should be a shield. And there are a wide variety of them. I'm going to go through the, sort of the best known types. Right. One of the first types is the tower shield. Tower shield covers most of the body, usually from the knee to the neck, sometimes even more. Uh, might even cover from the neck down to uh, your ankles. Uh, which picture to the right is the scutum the Roman scutum, which is sort of this rectangular and domed shield. Um, this was used in conjunction with the short sword, the gladius. Uh, this evolved from um, 
earlier Greek or earlier Roman infantry, which are uh, outfitted in the same way as Greek infantry were, which is the big round hoplon shield. Again, if anybody's seen 300 or played any sort of game with Greek soldiers in it, it's a hoplon. It has a large round shield that again goes from pretty much the neck down to the knees. It's also one of the reasons why Greek armor is the way it is, why the Greeks have that big greaves. Greaves cover the um, the lower leg, so the uh, ankle, um, the shin up to the knee, and the foot. Because that was the one part that the hoplon wouldn't cover. And again, with the helmet is another part where it wouldn't cover. Uh, that's also why they didn't wear any hand protection, really, but they did wear chest protection. Because the shield did most of the work, because shield was incredibly important. If you have a fantasy armor, any fantasy or anything re- resembling a medieval army or an ancient army should have spears and shields and helmets too. That would be the second piece of armor you'd want after a shield. But that's what they should have. You know, they shouldn't just be going around with swords everywhere. Swords are great. They're really, really cool. No one's going to dispute that fact, but spears are a lot more useful. Um, tower shields are used mostly by heavy infantry. Roman infantry was heavy infantry of the time. We wouldn't think of it in, med- in medieval terms. If people were clad, you know, knights were knights were essentially heavy armor, uh, heavy infantry, and they were clad head to toe in plate armor, uh, sometimes with a shield. But of their day, Romans were, you know, anybody who used a tower shield essentially was considered sort of heavy infantry. Um, excels in formations, but it is heavy, so it's a little little less uh, easily wield in single combat. Um, and those kind of restrict your movement because you can't really move. You know, your shield, you move around your shield a bit as well as just moving the shield around y- yourself. Um, so obviously the bigger the shield, the less wield is going to be in single combat. See also the hoplon. I don't have a picture of a hoplon. I should have put it up there, but it's pretty much just a big round shield. If you look up 300, that's what the Greek soldiers used. It's a big hoplon. You just put in hoplon, which is the type of shield, which is also what the hoplites are named after. Um, that's pretty much what they used. And that was considered, considered a heavy infantry as well. Greek soldiers were, uh, Greek hoplites or hoplites, however you want to pronounce it, were considered heavy infantry. Uh, kites. A kite shield. Kind of like similar to a... Uh, uh, a tower shield, kind of covering more or less the same area, maybe a little bit further down to, again, the ankle to around the, uh, uh, just a little bit past the neck. This is used, again, by Vikings. Vikings also use round shields as well, and we'll see some of that later on. Um, but it's very versatile. Uh, it's used by both infantry and cavalry. We have um, examples of in the Bayo Tapestry, which depicts the Battle of Hastings in 1066, of uh, knights using this in, con- in conjunction with sort of full body um, male ar- suits of armor on horses and on foot. Um, it's a little bit, t- it's kind of, it's kind of long to be used on a horse. Um, a little bit unwieldy, but for the most part, it's, a, it's an excellent shield. It's a really good all around shield. And one of the people I watch online, which is one where I get the information from, Shadowversity, this is his favorite type of shield, and I can certainly see why. Uh, it's lighter and more maneuverable than a tower shield because it's obviously less material. And there are, the way the grip was designed, is, I agree with Shadowversity here, it's the best design for a shield. So you can use it as if you have your hands like kind of right here. So you have your uh, hands parallel with this. You also have your hands parallel with this, so kind of up and down. You can also hold it in the center grip, which is uh, right behind what's called a boss, which is that big kind of dome metal thing out there. Uh, You can use it a bunch of different ways. It also had a leather strap that can go around your your body, almost like uh, you put like a satchel on there, and you can carry it around. So if you're running a D&D campaign, you're worried about encumbrance, you can easily... um, uh, put this on your back, and at a moment's notice, there's a grip for you to grab it from your back and use it in combat like that in, in like the, a second. Uh, so anybody that has a campaign like that or is writing a book that features somebody using this type of uh, shield, kite shield is a good way to go. Uh, round shield. This is an example of the round shield from the back. You see this long stick is where you would grab into it, and then there's the boss of it. Um, Sizes vary greatly. You can have sometimes small ones, like uh, early uh, ancient Greek 
from classical antiquity, uh, a skirmisher would use. It's called a pelta shield, P-E-L-T-A, which is a very small shield. It's actually where they get, again, that unit gets its name from, peltist. Uh, they had some that are really big, like the Hoplon, again, that were massive. Vikings also used a shield that was also pretty big. I wouldn't say the Hoplon's massive, but it's a big shield. Um, useful in a bunch of different combat situations. Can be used in single combat, can be used in formations. Um, fairly maneuverable. I don't know if any round shield was ever used on horseback, but um, you can use it in a variety of different ways. And again, Captain America's shield is a round shield. This is more commonly your shield. His original shield was a heater shield. Uh, this kind of replaced the kite shield. The shields started getting smaller and smaller as armor became more and more effective. Again, the kite shield was used uh, during the time when mail was the dominant uh, bit of armor. And it was used again on horseback. The heater shield just a small... Think of the heater shield as a smaller version of a kite shield. And it's a lot more maneuverable on horseback. Um, and again, as armor became more and more effective, as plate became more and more prominent, the use of a shield kind of died out because your armor was so thick and was so effective, you didn't really need a shield anymore. Because it could stop missile attacks, could stop arrows, could stop crossbow bolts, usually. And it was very effective at stopping them. Uh, so you didn't really need a shield, and it was just better off to get more range. So you have full plate armor and a pole arm. But again, that's later combat. Uh, and then you have small shields. Um, up top is a targe or targe, and the bottom is a buckler shield. And the buckler shield is more or less, it's maybe a little bit smaller than what's depicted here. This is sort of a recreation, but it's around this size, and a targe is just a lot bigger. Think of a targe about the size of like a medium or a large pizza. Um, not very big. Uh, both of these were used. The buckler has been around for a long time. The buckler was around um, sort of, I'd say, the 11th century, 12th century around there, and used all the way all the way up. This is also used as a self-defense weapon. If you were, had a sword, um, like an arming sword, I probably should have gone through the uh, classifications of a sword, but you know, a uh, one-handed sword is called an arming sword. A bastard sword is between a one-handed sword and a long sword. Um, so you have kind of arming sword, which is a small grip. Viking swords, by the way, were arming swords, technically speaking. Uh, they were one-handed and meant to be used in conjunction with a shield, and you could use it with a round shield. You could use it with a uh, or a buckler shield, uh, which it was often used. One of the earliest examples, one of the earliest treaties. And martial arts, a European martial arts manual we have from the time is called 133, and involves the use of a buckler and an arming sword. Um, this, the buckler and the uh, arming sword, would have been used during the time of uh, William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. Uh, contrary to what Braveheart says, uh, one Scottish didn't use didn't use kilts back then. They wouldn't use it for quite some time later. And they didn't have two-handed swords either. Um, if you ever see Outlaw King, excellent movie. I recommend it. Also pretty historically accurate. There's some things that are off about it, but for the most part, it's very, very accurate historically. I uh, highly recommend it. But uh, the Targe was also used um, used by Jacobites and uh, Scottish forces, the Scottish shield, um, used, again, into the 1700s, so the 18th century. Uh, is often used in conjunction with a claymore. Now, there are two types of claymores, by the way, uh, just a quick aside. You have the two-handed claymore and the broadsword claymore. Now, a broadsword is not a longsword. Uh, and also, the difference between an arming sword and a longsword and a greatsword is just essentially the longer the, you know, a longsword is just an arming sword with a longer grip and a longer blade. And a greatsword is just a longsword with a longer grip and a longer blade. And they're used in different ways. Um, long sword you can use with one hand, but it's probably best to use two-handed. Arming sword you can only use one-handed, and a great sword is meant to be used only two-handed. But um, you have some uh, swords like a broadsword, which is simply a basket hilted, almost like a rapier kind of weapon. That's what a broadsword really is. So you're looking at 
broadswords are around the time of sort of renaissance so around like the 1400s to the 1700s things like that that's where you'd get broadswords at but uh excuse me and broadswords are used in conjunction with the targes. Um so this is a late shield and uh, again, uh, the term swashbuckler comes from the noise a sword makes. So you'd have your arming sword on your um, right next to your buckler. So as you'd walk, they would clang together and make a swashing noise, I guess. That's how you describe it. To me, it just sounds like a clanging noise. So your sword would swash against your buckler, hence the term swashbuckler. Uh, I don't know why the hell we use that to, to uh, describe pirates, because at the time of pirates, both bucklers and arming swords were out of use. Uh, targes would have been in use at that time. Uh, and again, targe, the word target comes from the targe, shield means to be aimed at. That's why targets are generally circular. Um, so these are smaller shields to have on you. They're like personal defense shields. Of course, the targe can be used, and the buckler was used in um, warfare, large scale warfare as well. But again, only as a second, only as a last resort. You'd want a larger shield and a spear as your primary weapons. And, uh, yep, that's it. Uh, that's the end of that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I had fun making it. Um, looking back on it, there are things that could improve, but isn't that how it always goes? Um, but, yeah, there are some ideas, uh, historical uses of weapons. Maybe they might help you writing your stories or your D&D campaigns. Um... I find that restrictions like this help you kind of help you get creative and give you something to deal with uh, in a way that makes sense that allows you to kind of overcome writer's block. He's like, okay, great. I, I I can't think of anything right now. My, I have this massive battle. How do I form the army? How do I form the enemies? How do I combat them? And using history as a way to give yourself solutions to those problems. Um, I don't know when I'm going to do a work stream next. Uh, if I do, I'll probably tackle tactics used in large-scale warfare. Um, again, from classical antiquity to uh, medieval and Renaissance armies. And probably most often to, like, mostly focusing on classical antiquity. Um, but in general, the tactics are used throughout history, at least when melee weapons are used. Uh so probably do that, but I don't know when this is going to be next. Uh, I don't know when it'll be available next. Um, I'm pretty sure nobody watches. I'm pretty sure nobody else will watch it. But if you did watch it, thank you. I uh, really enjoy your patronage. I'm Don from Endless Terminal Softworks. We are an indie company. I am the head writer. And uh, hope you'll join me for my next work stream or play stream, which the next play stream we do have is on the 29th. I believe we're going to be streaming Dark Souls 3. And that'll be Shelby. And maybe I'll join in. I don't know. Um, that's all I have to say. And uh, yeah, Emperor Protects.